Hello, my little fruity pebbles, and happy holidays. Get comfy cozy. Just kidding. Today's all about high octane thrills, violence, dubious politics, and terrorism. Well, you know, mostly about terrorism, honestly, so no comfort for you. Just kidding. Again, because uh, I really do hope that you enjoy this video and share a cup of tea with me, regardless of how gruesome today's topic is. Here's an agenda for today's video. We're gonna run through a breakdown of the movies and their general plots, a bit about the actors and how the films were received and reviewed by public and critics alike. We'll then move into defining terrorism, understanding terrorism research as a field and how it kind of functions. And then we'll look at the impact that terrorism has on politics including how it shifts political participation, political ideologies of the public, and other public responses. Then I get to go full conspiracy board to deduce Morgan Freeman's, aka President Alan Trumbull's, political stances within the fallen films. And finally, I'll wrap it all up and tie it in a nice bow for you by answering this question. How likely is Morgan Freeman's rise to political power in the fallen cinematic universe? Spoiler alert, I guess, for the Fallen Cinematic Universe released between 2013 and 2019, as if anyone actually cares. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> it's made up of the movies Olympus Has Fallen, London Has Fallen, and Angel Has Fallen. In the process of doing research for this video, I also found out that we're getting a fourth film called Night Has Fallen, and I am absolutely amped for it and then i think that it might be also like a spin-off series at some point on like hbo or something like that that's coming out if i can put on a franchise in the background for 10 plus hours straight like lord of the rings and eventually with the fourth movie there will be 10 plus hours of content for the fallen cinematic universe i don't really give two shits of how good or bad they are i'm a happy camper just to sit and Absorb. Olympus Has Fallen, the first film in the franchise, was released in 2013. It opens with the tragic death of President Benjamin Asher's wife, which his head of Secret Service, Mike Banning, is unable to prevent. As a result of President Benjamin Asher's wife's death, Mike Banning is shafted to some very unclear, nondescript job at the Treasury where he does this? What is, is he throwing the ball against the computer monitor? I don't particularly know what job that could possibly entail, but he always wants to get back into the action. He finally gets his chance at redemption when North Korean terrorists infiltrate the South Korean delegation to the White House and launch an assault simultaneously from the air from outside the White House and even from within the president's bunker. The president had brought the South Korean leader and his team into the bunker despite it not being protocol. Let's go, move. Yeah. Mr. Lee, please join us. That's not protocol, oh, sir. A foolish mistake, which very well may prove to be his last. It isn't, but you know, it probably should have been. So Mike Banning gets inside the White House and establishes communication with a team of people led by acting president Alan Trumbull. He was the Speaker of the House at the time, but because both the President and Vice President were taken hostage, he was next in line and placed under secret security, secret security, <laughs> and placed under secret service detail by Angela Bassett, aka Director of Secret Service, Lynn Jacobs. The North Koreans demand that the U.S. pull troops and ships away from the DMZ so that North Korea can basically finish its civil war with South Korea. But they also want these three codes to a US program called Cerberus, which can detonate US nuclear warheads in case of inadvertent launch. The terrorists manage to get all three of the codes by threatening and beating up people, and then also shooting and killing some people, and then they activate the program on a timer to detonate the nukes in their silos hoping to turn America into a nuclear wasteland. Mike Banning is on the clock and manages to save the day, kill the terrorist, save the president's son and the president himself, and stop a Cerberus. This is Banning. I have the president. He's hurt, but alive. How do I switch this fucking thing off? Redeeming himself from his perceived failures and preventing America's nuclear destruction. T.Y. Mike Banning. Cut to the second film of the franchise, London Has Fallen. We open on a beautiful wedding of the daughter of a notorious arms dealer, a criminal shielded by governments, as President Asher puts it later in the film. The US authorizes a fucking drone strike and they blow up an entire community of people celebrating love and connection, 
but manage not to kill the main villain, Amir Barkawi, or any of his sons. They're pissed, obviously, and rightly so, so they create this massive plot to infiltrate police and other primary services in London, kill the British Prime Minister with poison, and then attack the funeral when all the important world leaders arrive, including our good old American president, Benjamin Asher. President Asher gets the call about the funeral and his security team begin to craft their protection plan with Mike Banning back to being the head of Secret Service. And it's still led by Angela Bassett as the director of Secret Service. Basically, as soon as the funeral gets underway, everything goes to shit. <laughs> like, it's bad. <laughs> The French president, the president of Japan, the Italian prime minister, and a bunch of other world leaders are murdered, along with hundreds of civilians and police officers. And several British landmarks are bombed as well. Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, etc. You can see the film for yourself. It's an absolute fucking disaster, and Mike manages to get President Asher and Director Jacobs onto a chopper headed for safe ground. To get there, Aaron Eckhart does this run, which gets me every time. <laughs> Their helicopter gets blown up by terrorists with fucking missile launchers. Missile launchers. Sounded like Sean Connery. Missile launchers on the roofs of nearby buildings, and for some reason, only Angela Bassett dies in the crash. Make those fuckers pay. I will. Now, it's just Mike and Ben on the run, aided by MI6 agent Jacqueline something or other, aka Jax, who is trying to find the mole who helped the terrorists from inside British security. The terrorists managed to capture President Asher and attempted to kill him live on camera in some random building in central London, but obviously, Mike saves the day by kicking ass, shooting people, and blowing up the building that they are actively trapped in. At the very end of the film, Jax finds the mole within the British security agency and kills him, Mike's wife has a baby, and Vice President Alan Trumbull launches another drone strike, but this time it actually does kill Amir Barkawi. So I guess the moral of the story isn't don't drone strike people, but just, you know, do it right so that you won't have to face the consequences of your actions. How incredibly grim, warped, and timely, I guess, is that? Free Palestine. I'm a Jew, by the way. The final film as of now, Angel Has Fallen. Angel, of course, being the codename for Mike Banning, head of Secret Service, who is now next in line to take over as director of Secret Service. This one opens on a training scenario, introducing Mike's old army buddy, Wade Jennings, head of Salient Global, a private security firm played by Danny Houston. He returns home to his new wife and baby Lynn, not an actual new wife, but they did replace the actress who played his wife in the first two with Piper Parabo. And honestly, they have so much better chemistry and she seems like a better actress overall. Sorry about it. So big win there for the franchise. Also, it's kind of adorable that they named their baby after Angela Bassett's character, who was supposed to be the baby's godmother, if she obviously hadn't tragically died in the helicopter crash in the second movie. You also see Mike around this time struggling with the physical and mental ramifications of being in several terrorist attacks, naturally. He's taking lots of painkillers and seeing doctors under pseudonyms to get more pills. Really not good. He's kind of a mess at this point, but still trying to carry on protecting the new president, President Alan Trumbull, who is taking a quick vacation fishing trip. He says to Mike that he no longer knows who to trust because some false info had been leaked to the press from inside the White House saying that Trumbull wanted to hire private contract security firms to help with war efforts, when in reality, it's the opposite. And he took a hardline stance against this practice during his campaign. While on the fishing trip, Wade Jennings' firm tries to assassinate President Trumbull and frame Mike Banning with falsified evidence that he's being paid by the Russian government. Both Mike and President Trumbull are helicoptered to a hospital. Mike wakes up shortly thereafter to find he's being detained and then will be transferred for arraignment for plotting the assassination attempt, whereas Trumbull is just in a coma. Vice President Martin Kirby, played by Tim Blake Nelson, steps up as acting president until Trumbull wakes up. With the information that the Russian government was possibly behind the attack, he has a plan to use a host of private contractor security firms to go to war with Russia. 
Dun, dun, dun. Wade Jennings' goon squad breaks Mike out of containment en route to his arraignment hearing, and then Mike escapes their capture, so he's on the run to prove that he's innocent. He connects with his long-lost father in the middle of the woods, and hijinks ensue. His father, played by Nick Nolte. Oop, oop, sorry. Um, that one is for my private collection. Nick Nolte is definitely the best character and provides much needed humor and levity to the series in general but also to this this particular movie they work together to blow up more guys chasing them from salient global firm and run from the fbi who is after them while also trying to like lead them leaving little breadcrumbs and stuff so that the fbi will get on wade jennings case instead of on to his mike knows that wade won't stop until he kills trumbull and then he sees a news story that Tremble is actually awake now and out of his coma. Tremble stops his VP Kirby from going to war with Russia, and Mike turns himself in to get close to the president so he can tell him how bad the situation is actually looking right now. Mike prevents the follow through on the assassination attempt, successfully protects the president, and has a shootout and fist fight with his old buddy that leads to Wade's death. We also get this absolutely incredible moment <laughs> during the fight that I love. Yeah, buddy, Mike, Mike, buddy. I don't really think she was planning on making much noise. <laughs> the film ends with Mike getting the job for director. His relationship with his father, wife, and kid are all restored, and the vice president, Martin Kirby, is arrested for masterminding this assassination attempt alongside Wade Jennings to reestablish private security firms in the war machine. Not too shabby. How do you think he did? Not too shabby. Marks out of 10? Like, out of a 1 to 10 scale, how do you think I think I did? 8? Generally, these movies are liked an average amount by viewers, enjoyed but mocked by movie critics, and they did decently in the box office. People seem to view these films as dumb, fun, propagandistic, archaic, entertaining, racist, jingoistic, reactionary, and predictable. And I, to be very clear, agree with every single one of these critiques. <laughs> Those who either enjoy the racism and jingoism, you know, they got their own stuff going on, or they describe themselves as being able to put it aside often have a great time with these movies, but for others that tends to get in the way, rightly so. The first film relies on a nuclear scare subplot, gross and unflinching violence, and fear-mongering of an Asian other. The second focuses on another racist stereotype of Middle Easterners as terrorists, and a significant majority of the good guys are white to add some racial contrast, really like hunker down on that stereotype. Ending with that horrible note of drone strikes are basically okay as long as you don't miss, made the second movie all that more fucked up. They also have all of this grossly nationalistic feel that you're supposed to valorize the American flag and president, which is also very, very present in the final film. Mike Banning himself represents a manifestation of the American hero and has redemption arc after redemption arc after redemption arc to ensure that that feeling really hits home. For whatever Rotten Tomatoes is worth, here are their critic and audience ratings for all three films on the screen. The first one was average, the second one was bad, and the third one had audiences and critics split. I mean, look at the audience rating, 93%. Some of the reviews are absolutely iconic and I will definitely be sharing them with you now. Critic Noah Berlatsky, for example, wrote a review in The Atlantic titled The Vile False Patriotism of Olympus Has Fallen and described it on Rotten Tomatoes as one of the most depressing and despicable films I have ever seen. London Has Fallen was hit even harder by reviews, not just for its overall lower quality, but also for the increase in racism and quite frankly, messed up morality. Here are two reviews highlighting the ugly side of this film. The first one's a little tame, but I think still highlights the comparison of the first and second. They say, while Olympus Has Fallen was an enjoyable action thriller, banning single-handedly overpowering the White House infiltrators, London Has Fallen is much harder to swallow. Another review reads, and this one kind of goes in on them. London Has Fallen is atrocious wildly implausible, casually racist, mean-spirited, and strangely defensive about US drone strikes that take out innocent civilians in the Middle East. Yeah, that kind of sums it up. I think Reddit user Death Cab for Booty, fantastic name by the way, said it well. The movie's politics are bad. Had this been released in the 1980s or 90s, it probably wouldn't have mattered as much, but having your main character shout, go back to fuck Hattistan or whatever, and then point blank execute a Middle Eastern man is outrageous. 
yes, that actually does happen in the movie. Having your terrorists infiltrate everyday society while millions of refugees are trying to escape hell on earth only to be accused of this is even worse. The entire attack on London was a revenge plot after the US blew up the villain's daughter's wedding. He, being Amir Barkawi, the main terrorist villain, had a point to make about the US sending its poor to fight its battles and get blown up overseas, and about how we rain death from the skies. How does this movie and its characters react to this? By fucking killing him with a drone strike in the closing moments and then cheering about it. Overall, it's an okay R-rated action movie with some okay actors and some okay action and some really bad morals. If you want to turn your brain off and enjoy it as mindless entertainment, you might have some fun. It's as obnoxious and brazen as a Trump speech. Two out of five. Thank you for that high quality review, Death Cab for Booty. The racism infused in this franchise was especially contentious because the second film, notoriously the one that had the most to say regarding race, came out around the same time as the 2016 Oscars when hashtag Oscars so white began trending on Twitter for the lack of diversity in the nominees. Not that any of these movies were in jeopardy of standing within a 10 mile radius of any kind of award, but Morgan Freeman added a little fuel to the fire during some interviews alongside the London Has Fallen release, wherein he described that the Academy was not to blame, but the producers, writers, and casting directors instead. If they don't write stories about or hire people of color, he explains, then it's already too late for the Academy to do anything. This perspective challenged a lot of people to think more upstream on the greater culture surrounding the institution instead of just focusing on the institution itself. The final film was hit hard by critics but generally appreciated by fans for its origin story vibe, as the director of the film, Rick Roman Waugh, has called it himself an origin story. Focusing on Mike Banning as a character above all else. On IndieWire, David Ehrlich wrote a review entitled Angel Has Fallen Review. A deranged Nick Nolte meets Hollywood's laziest action franchise. And <laughs> this one will always get me. <laughs> um, and he describes Gerard Butler as <laughs> Elite Secret Service agent with a heart of gold and a face of raw meat. <laughs> okay, I like, I don't know what he's saying, but I also 100% do know what he's saying. <laughs> face of raw meat. Okay, and then he continues on. He saved the world a couple of times over the last few years and he's forced to do it again. That one really got me. Okay. Here are a few key reviews that emphasize the general vibe of the third film's reception. Gerard Butler takes viewers on a thrill ride as he fights for his reputation and his life. You know, pretty tame, very neutral. Efficient B-movie trash that I enjoyed watching, I enjoyed myself, and I really hadn't expected to. A little harsh, but you know, uh, also kind of positive. And here is my favorite of all the reviews by Claudia Puig. The franchise has fallen and it can't get up. Well, it certainly won't get back up after taking that kind of beating, Claudia. Well done. Angel Has Fallen also poked fun at American politics around the time of its release with VP Martin Kirby using the line, Make America Strong Again, to talk about wanting to utilize privatized security contractors, and he also made mention of Russian interference with the Trumbull election and then with the Trumbull assassination. See any U.S. politics connections from 2019? Oh no, yeah, me neither. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. It's fine. One last note I definitely want to say before I end this section on reviews. I'm honestly astounded and disappointed in these reviewers because only one person mentioned in all of the reviews that I've seen, and I have seen so many when doing this research, that mentions this hilariously bad scene at the very, very end of the third film where they're at this thing called the G20 Summit, and they horribly, horribly edit Morgan Freeman next to Vladimir Putin. Like, it's he's supposed to be a part of this huge summit of like international presidents, and the editing is so bad, and it's kind of hilarious and amazing. <sighs> I just love it. This is why I love bad movies. Like, this is this is what gives me life. Critics, though, you do need to do better because more of you should have been talking about the G20 Summit. Where is the G20 Summit review? Jesus Christ. Before we get started on understanding how terrorism influences political participation, both voter turnout itself and the direction of voter participation toward a particular political ideology, 
we first need to understand and get a grasp on how to define terrorism itself. Unfortunately, there's no great consensus on how to define terrorism. Not even the UN has an internationally agreed upon definition. Different government agencies and organizations, different states, different bodies all have separate definitions that suit their own particular role, purpose, or bias. After reading dozens of definitions, a general one that I've created is that terrorism is the illegitimate and unjust use of force or the threat of force against innocent people to accomplish some kind of political goal. Torbjorgo described it as a set of methods of combat rather than an identifiable ideology or movement and involves premeditated use of violence against primarily non-combatants in order to achieve a psychological effect of fear on others than the immediate targets. The part about it being others than the immediate targets I think is a really key point here. Britannica in their definition highlights that it is practiced by political organizations on both ends of the spectrum, by nationalistic and religious groups, by revolutionaries, and even by state institutions such as armies, intelligence services, and police. They then separate terrorism into three broad classes. You have revolutionary, sub-revolutionary, and establishment terrorism. Revolutionary terrorism has the goal of abolishing and replacing a political system, whereas sub-revolutionary terrorism is used to modify existing social and political structures. Establishment terrorism, also known as state-sponsored terrorism, is used by governments against its citizens, factions within the government, or foreign governments and foreign groups. I want to make particular note of the definition that Fernando Ranares created because he was specifically talking about terrorism definition within the context of academic study. So why is this particularly important? Well, the research that I parsed through for this video to understand how terrorism impacts politics was primarily within the context of academic peer-reviewed sources. So his framing will be helpful in knowing how articles that I was parsing through are likely to interpret terrorism. He states that there are three key traits that define terrorism for the purpose of academic study. Firstly, it's an act of violence that produces widespread disproportionate emotional reactions such as fear and anxiety, which are likely to influence attitudes and behavior. Secondly, the violence is systemic and rather unpredictable and is usually directed against symbolic targets. And thirdly, the violence conveys messages and threats in order to communicate and gain social control. Terrorists themselves tend to distance themselves from the word terrorism given its negative connotations and use terms like freedom fighter, guerrilla, insurgent, and revolutionary. These words are often used to evoke images of freedom and liberation, armies, or other military organizational structures, actual self-defense movements, or righteous vengeance. They also sometimes will just use terms that are like relatively neutral. Osama bin Laden did not separate himself from the term terrorism, however, but rather distinguished between good and bad terrorism by saying, and yes, I'm about to quote Osama bin Laden, hopefully y'all are cool with that, terrorism can be commendable and it can be reprehensible. Terrifying an innocent person is objectionable and unjust. Also, unjustly terrorizing people is not right. Whereas, terrorizing oppressors and criminals and thieves and robbers is necessary for the safety of people and protection of their property. The terrorism we practice is of the commendable kind, for it is directed at the tyrants and the aggressors and the enemies of Allah, the tyrants, the traitors who commit acts of treason against their own countries and their own faith and their own prophet and their own nation. Terrorizing those and punishing them are necessary measures to straighten things and to make them right. Finally, I want to share the most comprehensive definition I found, which was from Bruce Hoffman's book entitled Inside Terrorism. He states, We may therefore now attempt to define terrorism as the deliberate creation and exploitation of fear through violence or the threat of violence in the pursuit of political change. All terrorist acts involve violence or the threat of violence. Terrorism is specifically designed to have far-reaching psychological effects beyond the immediate victims or object of the terrorist attack. It is meant to instill fear within, and thereby intimidate, a wider target audience that might include a rival ethnic or religious group, an entire country, a national government or political party, or public opinion in general. Terrorism is designed to create power where there is none, or to consolidate power where there is very little. Through the publicity generated by their violence, Terrorists seek to obtain the leverage, influence, and power they otherwise lack to affect political change on either a local or international scale. Okay, now that we have a handle on what terrorism actually is, let's look at the wider field of research that studies how terrorism impacts its victims.
I want to come into this section and be like, okay, these are the exact ways that terrorism influences citizens' political involvement and their political opinions, but research on this topic is extremely split. Some articles say that there is some impact in one direction, and some say that there's, you know, another impact in a different direction, and others say that there's no impact at all. I thought it would be helpful to explain a bit of why there are mixed results and explain some of the complications that arise within the research on the effects of terrorism before moving to the specific effect that it has on citizens' political participation, opinions, and other behaviors that I found in these studies. By explaining where the research falls short or where there are difficulties within it, you'll be able to judge the research that I lay out a bit more critically. One important point is that it's difficult to identify the effect of terrorist attacks on electoral behavior because it's hard to isolate from other electoral expectations or public opinion trends. Basically, even with comprehensive statistical analyses, there are just way too many confounding factors to definitively say that the changes in political participation or opinions are specifically a result of the terrorism that the populace experienced and not something else that's happening. It's also important to note that it's hard to connect specific targets of terrorists and their meanings by interviewing victims or by looking at geographical data on targets because they usually have some sort of ideological, ethnic, or religious connection in the mind of the perpetrators that is obviously unknown to the victims. And very little, if any, research has been done by interviewing the terrorists themselves, so at most, it's the best guess of the victims or the best interpretations of academics. Another key point is that terrorism itself is really complex. There are a variety of different types of outcomes, goals, countries and groups involved, and types of threats such that comparing studies within the field are often limited in their efficacy. Sure, like someone could say that the result of 9-11, for example, has a particular effect on a certain subsector of the US populace, their political participation, but it's unlikely that another country with a different history and demographic makeup would have the same resulting effect if the same event occurred there. Even just comparing particular instances of Islamic terrorism or right-wing terrorism within the same country can be difficult if they're done for different purposes or by different groups because they could just be lumped together when they don't really have as much in common. This one article entitled How Terrorism Does and Does Not Affect Citizens' Political Attitudes, a meta-analysis by Amélie Godfreit, hopefully got that one okay, talks about the field of terrorism effect studies saying that a majority of the acts studied are either 9-11, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the 2015 series of IS attacks in Paris. In other words, a significant majority of all research on terrorism is based on just a few events that focus on Islamic terrorism in particular. There is very little research, both generally and comparatively, on far-right terrorism. Research on terrorism is also done predominantly by the US and Israel, with the US making up 37% of the studies found in this meta-analysis and Israel making up 19%. 15 European countries combined make up 50% of the studies, which is still less than the 56% combined by just the US and Israel. And there were only seven studies found in the meta-analysis from non-Western contexts. This is particularly complicated because countries that have a history of vulnerability to terrorist violence, like Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria, Nigeria and Pakistan, for example, are mostly missing from the literature. Therefore, we still know surprisingly little about how people in countries most affected by terrorism cope with such severe and sustained threats, as Godfreud puts it. However, this could be a sampling bias, as it's likely that many of the studies from these nations are published in languages or outlets that were not found and then therefore not included in the meta-analysis, or that they use different terms to denote violence and therefore were not included in her study. There's also an issue with sampling. Most of the research that Godfrey analyzed was done on students or convenience samples, and most is from the perspective of majority group citizens, not minority groups. Finally, this article highlights how the field is primarily event-driven, which greatly limits the ability of research to study the topic of terrorism. Either the researcher specifically goes to an area after an event has already taken place and tries to assess how this event impacted the people of that area or nation, without a solid base of data to compare it to from before the event, in which case, how can you truly know the impact of this event? Or someone is already doing research in an area, an attack happens, and then they try to understand within their data set before and after what shifted. Neither are particularly good at getting 
the whole picture. All of these factors limit the ability of many researchers to generalize their findings at all, and most are unable to generalize beyond the specific question of does Islamist terrorism affect, insert dependent variable here, within Western societies, because that's just pretty much only what's being studied. Not only, but mostly what's being studied. With all that said, let's take a look at some of the results from the studies I found, which tend to show some impact on electoral politics after terrorist attacks. Depending on the type of terrorist organization, the type of terrorist attack, the targets, the country within which it took place, and a number of other important factors, the effect will change, which is a significant reason why some studies show big impacts, some show small ones, and some will show no impact on politics whatsoever. Still, there are a few key impacts that I want to highlight as they seem the most consistent across the research that I found. Overall, it appears that terrorist attacks increase voter participation in subsequent elections. For example, a study analyzing eight terrorist attacks in Spain between 1989 and 1997 by the group, oh god, um, Euskaditaskatasuna, oops, I always feel bad about saying names wrong, but it's also a terrorist organization, so I'm like, hmm, am I supposed to feel bad? I don't really know. I guess it's like disrespectful to get names wrong in general, but like, again, it's a terrorist organization. I don't know. They're known as ETA, and I will only be referring to them as such from now on. So there's a study that analyzed a bunch of their terrorist attacks, and they found that those attacks increased individuals' intent to participate in democratic elections by 2 to 3% on average. Over time, however, they found that the effect decreased. So if an election happens shortly after an attack, then it's more likely that there will be a larger impact on the election results. Another article looked at the impact of right-wing terrorism in Germany, which found that successful terrorist attacks result in a 6% point increase in state election participation. While these numbers are statistically significant for those articles, an article by Bacini et al. looking at the impacts of terrorism on voter behavior in the US found that it was unlikely for the impact of terrorism to change the results of presidential and non-presidential elections based on the data that they had analyzed between 1970 and 2016. The question then becomes what sorts of elements will increase participation further and possibly lead to genuine election influence. Returning to the study on ETA in Spain, both lethal and non-lethal attacks significantly increased individuals' intent to participate in the next election, and the magnitude of this impact is larger when the attacks are directed at civilians or politicians rather than members of military or police. Other factors that influenced Spanish citizens' mobilization included being from the area where ETA was based, so if they lived in the same community that the terrorist group, like, you know, was based. If they hadn't voted in the previous election, then they were more likely to increase voter participation in the following election after a terrorist attack and if the voters identified as center-left politically. Very interesting. From here, the next logical questions are, why do people increase their participation in elections after terrorist attacks, and do they tend to shift left or right politically as a result? Let's look at the first question by returning once again to the ETA study by Leia Belcells and Gerard Torres Espinosa. They suggest that exposure to violence and its associated trauma can induce individuals to engage in politics to overcome trauma, to show discontent, and to try to fix the conditions that led to their victimization. Okay, that's really great and all, people doing their civic duty to engage and have their voices heard, but what sorts of political opinions do people tend to express after they feel victimized by terrorists? Here's where a majority of the research that I've done comes in, so strap in. One final time, we will come back to the Balcells and Torres Espinosa study, and then I promise we will move on to others. There are others. I have done more research than just this one article. They just have like a lot of really juicy stuff in there, and I can't help myself by digging my little teeth in. They note that individuals interviewed after attacks are more concerned about terrorism, are more likely to think that public safety is the most important value in a society, are more supportive of law and order approaches to delinquency, are more likely to think that criminals have a tendency to reoffend, and are more likely to think that the function of prisons is to protect society and not to rehabilitate criminals. So, those are all relatively conservative ideas, and so I think it's important to note that people seem like they're starting to have this general shift 
of having some more conservative ideas about how safety should work in society. Expanding on the Godfrey's article from earlier, she explains that after terrorist attacks, people tend to increase outgroup hostility and in-group solidarity to a small but significant degree. She continues on saying that threats and acts of terrorism are found to harden people's attitudes toward outgroups in general, but towards Muslims, Arabs, immigrants, and refugees in particular, in a sort of guilt by association impact from Islamic terrorism, which tends to result in support for restrictions on the rights and liberties of those disliked groups and more stringent anti-immigrant policies. Alongside these outgroup hostilities, there is a general conservative shift in times of terror, supporting things like retaliatory, military, and conflict perpetuating solutions to terrorism over more conciliatory or democratic solutions. But Freud also notes that there is a stronger preference for national security at the expense of civil liberties afterwards and a boost in the popularity of far-right and authoritarian political parties and politicians. She also does this, like, God, her research is very interesting. She does a fantastic job at analyzing why mentally and emotionally people respond in these particular ways. It's kind of a large chunk of text, but I think it's really helpful and I wanna read it out for you so that we can parse through it together. So here we go. She says, on a cognitive level, terrorism is thought to prime the inevitability and unpredictability of death, trigger the idea that oneself and one's country is in danger, heighten perceptions of injustice and moral violations, and prompt particular blame attributions. At a more abstract level, terrorism thus challenges basic human assumptions about the world as being predictable, safe, and benign. The motivated social cognition approach argues that when confronted with a world that appears dangerous and unpredictable, people, even self-identified liberals, will adhere more strongly to conservative, authoritarian, and right-wing candidates, policies, and ideologies. On an effective level, terrorism elicits a complex state of negative emotional arousal. In the immediate aftermath of attacks, Citizens often feel anxious and scared, angry and outraged, sad and dejected. In the realm of terrorism effect studies, feelings of anger in the wake of an unjust attack are believed to stoke a desire for more high-risk and retaliatory measures such as military action or far-right voting, with fear being a driving force behind support for more risk-averse and precautionary measures such as the deportation of immigrants, increased isolationism, or ethnic profiling. To sum up this article, Godfreud states that prejudiced, conservative, and inward-looking responses to terrorism are particularly noticeable in the U.S., and when attacks are carried out by Islamic terrorists or others perceived as outgroup members. I will come back to this shortly by expanding on the idea of a rally-around-the-flag effect, as they call it. So far, these articles seem to be expressing that people generally shift right when terrorists attack. But what if there's already a conservative in office when terrorists attack. What impact does that have? Well, an article looking specifically at terrorism and voting behavior in the US, written by Leonardo Baccini, Abel Brodeur, Sean Nosek, and Aaron Shore, analyzes terrorist attacks between 1970 and 2016, with data separated by type of attack, target, weapon, and logistics, as well as motives and submotives. They explained that voters have difficulty understanding what exactly the government is doing in the way of counterterrorism. So when they observe terrorist attacks, they see them as a signal to assess the competence of the government in power. Another article by Christoph Chanowitz, Chawanyets, Chow, Chawanyets, Christoph Chawanyets, I'm sorry. Um, Another article by him also affirms this idea by demonstrating that if there are repeated acts of terror during a political rule, they are more likely to receive criticism. However, Baccini et al. found that terrorism increases the vote for the Republican Party almost exclusively when the president is Republican, a sort of incumbency effect, and also when the attacks are hate or politically based. They also note that as the number of fatalities increases, terrorist attacks are less likely to electorally favor the Republicans than the Democrats. So big ones help the Republicans less than they normally do. The only other significant finding they explained was that anti-abortion attacks specifically result in a decrease in Republican votes, but only when a Democrat is the incumbent, which is you know also very interesting, but kind of irrelevant within the context of the fallen cinematic universe. Barely any words are spoken on actual political issues outside of international affairs, and there is certainly nothing on abortion within the series. So yes, interesting. I wanted to include it just because it's like kind of an important note for that article and also it's really, again, interesting. 
Ugh, I said the word interesting so many times. I feel that way. Another article I found looks specifically at right-wing terrorism in Germany. This one highlights that the rise of right-wing populism can be partially attributed to voter dissatisfaction triggered by economic insecurity and distress, globalization shocks, and government austerity. Terrorist attacks both successful and failed, meaning that it either occurred as planned or not, led to increases in right-wing populist party vote share in state elections, despite the fact that most attacks within Germany during the data collection period were committed by right-wing nationalists against migrant communities. Terrorism itself decreases trust in democratic institutions and can consolidate power in the executive branch. All of these elements combine to create this really intriguing cycle wherein conservative terrorism leads to more conservative voter participation and more conservative politicians, therefore, who then encourage more conservative ideologies that contribute to more conservative terrorism. So it's like this positive feedback loop of conservative terrorism and conservative ideologies feeding into one another. The authors, Navid Sabet, Marius Liebold, and Guido Fribel, explain this phenomenon by saying, this particular result is also in line with what Norris and Engelhardt 2019 term the authoritarian reflex, the notion that groups in society left behind by globalization may react defensively to shocks that undermine security, including terrorism, by adopting more extreme ideological positions themselves. This authoritarian reflex is further highlighted in a New York Magazine article on how 9-11 impacted the Democratic Party. The author Ed Kilgore described the damage done to the Democratic Party because they were often viewed as weak on war and moved to become more hawkish in order to gain the votes of those who moved toward a more conservative, security-focused position. In 2000, there was a nine-point advantage for Democratic candidates by women voters which completely disappeared in 2002, with the primary reason being 9-11. As the article states, soccer moms are security moms now. The main Democrats to still win elections in 2002 were pro-war and those with military heroic records. Democrats felt defensive about their perceived weakness on national security, and so the message in 2006 was the fighting Dems, a so-called progressive militarism. Obama was also strategically ambiguous on war and made sure that everyone knew that he was being advised by a 60-member group of former high-ranking military officers. I mean, one of the biggest moments in his entire time in office was the finding and killing of Osama bin Laden. That is all to say, yeah. People move right politically when terrorism happens. So far, I've described how people's opinions and political participation changes, but I haven't exactly laid out how citizens respond to the government in power during or after a terrorist attack. Several of the articles I've already discussed emphasize this idea called a rally around the flag effect. The Gottfried meta-analysis does a particularly thorough job of explaining in what circumstances this happens. She explains that violent acts perpetrated by Islamist actors in Western countries, especially in the US, generate substantially stronger rally around the flag effects in the populace. The rally around the flag effect, <laughs> such a mouthful, seems to be uniquely strong to rally around Bush, specifically in the post 9-11 era. In fact, only studies conducted in the US result in a statistically significant and substantial overall rally around the flag effect. Keep this in mind for the big question that we're here to answer. She continues on to say that in order to cope with the trauma of terrorism, citizens tend to become more deeply attached to and trust their nation and its leaders. An article by Christoph Chauanietz affirms this idea of a rally around the flag effect and says that it increases as the number of fatalities increases typically resulting in a unified front across political parties. If there are specifically Islamist actors, it's the context of the US, and there is a big terrorist attack, all of those things increase the rally around the flag effect of like, you know, getting closer to and trusting your nation and its leaders, which makes a lot of sense why that effect was so big for 9-11. One final note that I wanna make is about political assassinations as it's specifically relevant to the Fallen franchise. Political assassinations of heads of state as a terrorist tactic undermine democracy by lowering voter participation and increasing a concentration of power in the executive branch to respond. This is a bit of an outlier in comparison to other tactics, including threats of terrorism, kidnappings, hijackings, bomb scares and bombings, cyber attacks, and the use of chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiological weapons, as well as other targets like military and civilian government facilities, airports, large cities, 
landmarks, public gatherings, water and food supplies, utilities, and corporate centers. Nations that do not have formal democracies, that have consolidated power in the head of state, and ones that lack clear succession, which often these three go hand in hand, are much more susceptible to statewide collapse upon the assassination of the head of a state. Whereas in a democratic system, the elimination of a head of state will have a shorter term impact on the socio-political order because they're more easily replaced and can incorporate the citizenry more easily. Okay, so we've defined terrorism, discussed the field of terrorism effects research, and looked at how terrorism impacts citizens' political participation and opinions. We've learned that people tend to move right, they tend to rally around the flag unless there are too many terrorist attacks, and start to view the party in power as incompetent, and increase participation in elections overall. Now, we get to put it all together and look at Morgan Freeman's role in The Fallen Films. To understand how likely Alan Trumbull's rise to power across the three films, from Speaker of the House to Vice President to President, actually is, we need to understand both how effective he was in responding to the three terrorist attacks and what his political stances are, because they do not explicitly state any political party allegiances in any of the films. I actually don't think that the words Democrat or Republican are uttered a single time at any point in any of the movies. So. How do we find out what Trumbull's politics are? Well, let's do some digging. We can first look at what he has to say and what he does in the franchise, of course. So, the first time that we really get to know him is when he makes this very hawkish militant suggestion in Olympus Has Fallen, where he recommends working with the South Korean Prime Minister to hint at war with North Korea. Minister Lee is going to want you to issue a joint statement, Mr. President threatening military action to get the North Koreans to stand down from the border and stop their missile tests, which I think we should give them. Ruth. Provided that the North Koreans are rational, which is dicey at best. We bluff, they call it, then what? Well, who says we'd be bluffing? Personally, I like to try to avoid a war. He kind of comes across like a child not getting what he wants for his birthday when he's scoffing. He's like, come on guys, Like, I just really want to bomb North Korea. Why are y'all being so weak? In the second film, VP Trumbull is the one who initiates both the opening drone strike and the one at the very end, which killed innocent civilians in the Middle East at first and finally killed the terrorists who perpetrated the attacks in London. This upholds the perception of him as relatively pro-military and pro-war. However, in the final film, President Trumbull's primary political stance changes drastically to be relatively anti-war and anti-private contractors involved in those wars. He describes frustration with spreading the military thin because the US engages in too much war. Maybe all these terrorist attacks and assassination attempts toward him, his colleagues, and his citizenry changed his mind about his previously hawkish politics. Now, in the 2010s, his pro-war ideology does not seem to be particularly Republican or Democrat in nature because American politics writ large were relatively militaristic, but it does feel like he leans conservative in the way that he approaches his militarism. For further evidence, though, we need to do some real sleuthing. So, this one, stick with me. <laughs> While Mike Banning is running through the hallways of the White House, hiding from North Korean terrorists, he passes by FDR's portrait. Why is this important, you might ask? Now, there is a room in the White House called the Roosevelt Room, named that by Nixon in 1969 to honor Teddy Roosevelt, who first built the West Wing, which is where the room is located, and to honor FDR, who expanded the West Wing, both Roosevelt's. It is traditional for both Teddy Roosevelt and FDR's portraits to be hung in that room. However, they would move which walls they were on based on which administration was in power. If a Republican administration was in power, they would hang good old Teddy's portrait above the mantle and move FDR's portrait to the south wall. When Democrats were in power, they would swap these two paintings locations in the room. So the most important one seems to be being above the mantle and the other one gets kind of like shafted to the south wall. However, in 1994, Bill Clinton did not switch the paintings back, essentially ending this practice. Still, with FDR's painting out of the Roosevelt Room and Olympus has fallen, we can assume that Teddy Roosevelt is in the Roosevelt Room on the mantle, thereby making President Benjamin Asher a Republican. OK, 
okay, all of that just to say something about a character who isn't played by Morgan Freeman? Well, I'm not done yet, so sit back down and let me add another pushpin to my conspiracy board. Alan Trumbull moves from Speaker of the House to Vice President in the second film, right? Well, President Benjamin Asher is in his second term at this point, which means that they ran on a ticket together. While these films are unrealistic and absolutely ridiculous, there hasn't been a cross-party ticket of president and vice president since John Quincy Adams and John C. Calhoun were in the White House together between 1825 and 1829. I am going to take that as like absolute definitive evidence that Trumbull is a Republican just like Benjamin Asher. So now we know that Alan Trumbull is a Republican, but how would he make these sort of political improvements, this political rise, with so many different terrorist attacks occurring while he and his Republican colleagues were in power for three consecutive presidencies. To answer that, we have to look at how he responded to those incidents and how that would look to the public. During the first attack where North Korean terrorists infiltrated the White House, killed the vice president, and took the president hostage, the Speaker of the House, Alan Trumbull, became acting president to handle the situation. Well, how did he do? He risked the entirety of the country's safety to save his colleagues. He failed to oust the terrorists during an attempted aerial insertion into the White House, aborting that mission halfway through while it was failing as half a dozen helicopters got shut down, one of which crashed into and completely destroyed an entire wing of the White House. If not for Mike Banning, Trumbull's incompetence would have led to the nuclear destruction of the entirety of the United States. So that sounds bad, right? But. According to the public, he appeared to be doing everything he could, stepped up as acting president, working alongside his international allies, and he made several speeches on TV that highlighted the resilience, strength, and functionality of the government and the nation despite the attack. Given that President Asher survived, the terrorists were killed, and the country wasn't destroyed, I believe that Trumbull looked like he rose to the occasion from the outside. Behind the scenes, he was clearly a bit of a mess, but politics is all about image, maybe. During the second attack in London, it fell primarily on the British security forces to create an environment of safety during the late prime minister's funeral. Instead, Mike Banning was able to save President Asher from terrorists while getting support from a team sent in by Alan Trumbull. Again, Trumbull steps up to the plate, conveys a sense of comfort to the American people through televised speeches, and gets credit for saving the president via Mark's, Mark fuck is Mark via Mike's heroic actions. I don't think that the American people would be too hard on Trumbull or the Republicans for being embroiled in this event, especially given that it took place in London and it was kind of like the British security's main job to do all of that. Additionally, Trumbull led the drone strike at the end, if you remember, killing the terrorists who committed these atrocities, and I can imagine that that would feel pretty encouraging and strong to a conservative voter base. Finally. President Trumbull is involved in an assassination attempt and is able to recover. However, after being in the hospital and unconscious, I feel it's pretty likely that people would question his capabilities. Because he performed well under the circumstances of the first two attacks, random unnamed characters throughout the series say positive things about him like, oh, he was just starting to turn things around, man, when he's in the hospital. I don't know if that's enough though. I feel like he would be viewed as weak, unable to protect himself and his country, especially after moving toward an anti-war approach in this last film. It feels likely that people would want a stronger and more conservative and hawkish candidate, so I don't think he would win re-election, but I guess we'll have to see the next installment in Night Has Fallen. Here we are at the end of our journey together, so let's return to the question at hand. How likely is Alan Trumbull's rise to political power given the events of the fallen cinematic universe and based on what we understand about how terrorism influences politics? Trumbull is a Republican who appears to the public to have handled three separate terrorist attacks relatively well. There is a unique intensity to American rally around the flag effect, and Republican leaders were in power during all three attacks. Given that citizens tend to participate more in elections and move for their right, favoring more militant responses, 
it's likely that if a Republican was already in power before, that there would be another one after these incidents. Not only is it likely that a Republican could rise to power under these conditions, but Trumbull would have been a great candidate to replace the assassinated vice president from the first movie because of his positive role in working as acting president. Then the transition from vice president to president would have been likely easy for him to do as well, especially with the drone strike at the end of the second film, which would have been somewhat analogous as a victory to Obama killing bin Laden in 2011. Let's all give Morgan Freeman a huge round of applause for a successful political career in this horribly terrorism prone universe. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, then I'm extremely grateful because I know that this was a bit of a journey together. I hope you enjoyed it and felt like you learned something along the way. I'm curious to know if any of y'all have seen any of these movies, what you think of them, and if you agree or disagree with my general assessment that Morgan Freeman's climb through the political ranks made basically more sense than anything that's happening today politically. Basically, only my close friends and acquaintances watch these videos, which like, yeah, of course. And so if you want to do a marathon of these videos at any point, hit me up and let's pick a Saturday. If you had a good time watching this video, go ahead and bike and prescribe down below. We are super close to a million subscribers. Last month we went from 12 to 13. So we're like really rounding the corner right now. We are like, we're right there. We're, we're just, we're right there. I hope you're doing well and I hope you're showing yourself and others how much love, gratitude, and kindness you have to offer the world. I will see you soon.